You're amazing. You're amazing. So amazing. You cause the sun, sun and moon to shine. I'm so glad you're mine. Oh, I'm glad to say you're mine. We stand in awe of you. You're amazed at the things you do. You're holy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain for me. Come on, say we stay in our view. Amazed at the things you do. You're holy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. For me, come on, let's sing it together. Say no one. Oh, say no one compares. See, I can search the globe and find no one. No. Come on, can you look your hands to heaven? Say you're amazing. Say you're amazing. Say you're amazing. Yes, you are. Come on, say it. No one compares. See, I can look high and low. Come on, lift those hands this evening. Come on, say, you're amazing. Say, you're amazing. Say, you're amazing. Come on, lift those hands. And say, you're amazing. I say, you're amazing. Say you're amazing, God. Say you're amazing. Say you're amazing. Hallelujah. Praise the name of our God. We give him glory, honor, and praise. Come on in the house this evening. Oh, he's amazing, even on a Wednesday. Yes, I know it's a Wednesday. Amen. I know it might be a little gloomy on the outside, but the S O N is showing up shining. On the inside, amen. He's amazing, isn't he? Well, God bless you. Good evening to you. Happy Wednesday. Happy Word Wednesday. Uh, welcome all of our Church One Charlotte family and friends. Those that are maybe even with us for the first time, we want to say a good God bless you and a happy Wednesday. Welcome to Word Wednesday time. I am your host, Pastor Charles Carter of the Church One Charlotte. Coming to you uh, as we've been uh, most recently from our stay-at-home studios, we want to make sure we're trying to do things as excellent as possible to continue the work that God has put our hands to. We're continuing on in the Word as always. Uh, as you join in, give us a good God bless you. Give us a hello, and we'd like to give you a shout out right back. Amen. Good to see you as always. A uh, follow us. On Facebook, so that when we schedule services, schedule Bible studies, you'll get a notification on when they're taking place. Uh, moving forward, as of right now, we're continuing with uh, our Sunday 1230 service right here. We're continuing also with our Wednesday at 5, of, I'm sorry, our Wednesday at 7 p.m. for our Word Wednesday time. Want to give a good God bless you too. Who was that that um that that's joining in? Praise God, a missionary, Marion Williams, a Deacon Lamar Evans, uh, Sister Nikki Nicole Miller. Good to see you, sis. God bless you. Good to see you all joining in. Uh, happy Wednesday to you. We're continuing on in the book of James, brother Tyrell Davis. Good to see you. God bless you, sir. We're continuing on in the book of James, and we're wanting to make sure that uh we're in all of our getting, continuing to get understanding. Amen. We've been moving through the last several weeks. Deacon Rodney, or oh, Trustee Rodney Thompson, good to see you, sir. God bless you. Uh, we want to make sure that we're continuing on. Uh, the last several weeks, we've been covering the book of James. We've been doing a 12-week study.
covering the book of James and all of the various uh, details, digging deeper, amen? It's the deep things, amen, that, that are going to get us to where we need to go. Surface knowledge can only get us so far. Come on, somebody. But we just thank God uh, for this study the last couple weeks. You know, we've been talking about uh, being a, not just a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. And, uh, and that was week one. We talked about in week two, we talked about persistence and double-mindedness and how scripture talks about in that first chapter of James, how a double-minded man or woman are, is unstable in all their ways. Well, my goodness, you can't get anywhere go, trying to go both ways. My goodness, no, you can't. No, no. A double-minded man or woman is unstable in all their ways. And that is a key uh, obstacle to the man or woman that's making an effort to be a doer in anything. Come on, somebody. We just thank God for those two weeks. Uh, week three. We talked about how the trials that were being uh, referenced in the first chapter of James, how they're not in competition, but they're in conjunction. They're in concert with temptation because that passage in the first chapter of James talks about trial uh, the first several verses and then it moves over to temptation. We talked about making sure we understood that those two are working in concert with one another. And we have to be aware of what's going on and how trial is causing certain types of temptation that we might be able to combat the works of the enemy. Combat anything that's working against us being doers of the word. Amen? Amen. And then last week, we talked about holding fast. Uh, just as you don't forget the image that is in the mirror, amen. Uh, Sister Jackson, good to see you. Ralph Adrian, good to see you, brother. God bless you. We talked about last week about making sure that we were holding fast to the word we heard that we might actually be able to walk out and do it, amen. Why? Because if we don't, we would be just like that man or woman that beholds himself in a mirror, just as the scripture was saying, and then immediately goes away and forgets the image that they saw. Oh, come on now. You know you don't forget uh, when you when you get in front of the mirror and you get to checking yourself out, you don't forget immediately uh, what uh, outfit you had on. No, you remember that. That image, that mirror itself produces an image that remains with you. We've got to make sure that we're running with God's word in that same fashion. Holding fast, even as the scripture says. Sister Lisa Brown, good to see you. God bless you, sis. So now, we're moving on this week. Uh, week five. We're moving on to the second chapter of James. Let's read that. Grab James, the second chapter. I'm going to read it in the NIV version because I believe it's going to give us a little more clarity and understanding about what's what was written, uh, what the author uh, Pastor James himself actually was trying to get across to the uh, not only the uh, parishioners or the congregation that he was pastor of there in Jerusalem. Yes, he was pastor of First, uh, First Christian Church of Jerusalem. Yes, indeed. Yes, he was. Amen. Uh, Maria Charmaine, good to see you. God bless you. So what was James trying to say there? Uh, let's look on to that because not only was he talking to those that were part of the church in Jerusalem, but to, to those that were spread out across the known world that they knew of. He was writing to all of them. Let's read and see what, uh, what we're uh, covering on tonight. James, the second chapter, verses 1 through, th through 13. James, the second chapter, verses 1 through 13. And it reads, starting at verse 1, My brothers and sisters, Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Lord have mercy. Let's move on to verse five. Verse five says, listen, 
my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? Verse 6, but you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Verse 7, are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him whom you belong? Amen. Maria Charmaine, God bless you. Brother Wilbert Neal Sr., good to see you. Sister Shimon Davis, good to see you. God bless you, sis. Let's read on. Verse 8, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right. Verse 9, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law just like a lawbreaker. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Verse 11. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Verse 12. Speak and act. Come on, you got to make note of that. Verse 12. Speak and act as though as those who are going to be judged by the law. That gives freedom. And lastly verse 13. Because judgment without mercy. Will be shown to anyone. Who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Oh come on somebody say amen. To the already blessed word. Sister Lanise Bennett. Good to see you sis. Bless you. James the second chapter. We're talking and, and we're covering. In our 12 week study. Uh, this evening. The sin of partiality. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. You say, man, preacher, I'm going to log out right now. You talking about sin tonight. I thought we was going to talk about something uplifting. We're getting there. Yes, we are, because this is real uplifting. This is lifting us and keeping us right in line with what we've been covering. You say, my goodness, how does that line up with being uh, not just a hearer, but a doer? Well, let's look into this. James is sharing with those that are reading this passage about recognizing the error of partiality. We've got to be aware of this because just like the passage said, you know, we got to watch out. Come in with your gator skin shoes on or your red bottoms on or whatever it might be. You got to watch out that you don't show partiality to someone that is dressed to appear one way. And then there's someone else that's dressed another way that would cause us to think or pass judgment that they are lacking in some kind of way. Many of you have seen the show called Undercover Boss. It's kind of funny, you know, and you got to watch out sometimes because you'll see how sometimes people immediately judge someone that they feel they might have some uh, level of rule over. Someone that maybe they don't think has anything to offer them and they can begin to treat them a certain way, uh, not realizing that the very person they're treating in a partially negative way is the very person, if they knew who they were, they would be treating them a different kind of way, a much better way. James is saying, watch out now. We got to watch out for the sin of partiality, not just because it's the right thing to do, uh, not just because, oh, uh, it sounds kind of golden rule-ish, you know, uh, not just because it seems like what you ought to do because you say, well, I wouldn't want somebody to do that to me, so I can't do that to someone else. That's great. That's important. But we got to dig a little bit deeper on tonight. Amen. Come on with me here. You got to realize something that James is trying to get across uh, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, under God's uh, divine direction. James is trying to get us somewhere that the early church uh, was messing up early. And what's interesting is it would seem that the early church 
uh, manhood and womanhood as a whole is still messing up in many instances, you know, because in, in many instances, if you watch how things are being done in this day and age, it is primarily because of the sin of partiality. The only reason people tell stories or, you know, lie online about where they are is because they are under the expectation that they will be treated negatively if they were to be transparent. You know what? I'm having some challenges right now. No, I'm not the CEO of, of this, that, and the third. No. Uh, yeah, well, I'm CEO of my front doorstep, you know, or whatever. You know, yeah, thank God for the fancy names. But uh, much of that is taking place because those that are doing that are doing it because they are operating and experiencing the repercussions of the sin of partiality. Lord have mercy. Where are we going with this? We got to beware of this because this behavior is infectious, y'all. And what is it infecting? That Oh, that not just the fact that, okay, if you're being negative to somebody, that person is going to be negative, and then another person is going to get around and that culture is going to spread. That may be a part of it, but I want you to realize something here. In verse 9, James says that this, if we show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law, just like lawbreakers are. Where are we getting at? It develops a hierarchy of what's possible in your life. It puts you in the same basket as those that you might be looking at kind of funny. You might be treating them differently. It puts you in the same basket. Sister Lisa Evans, good to see you. God bless you. It puts us in the same basket as those that we maybe are potentially using that partiality against. You say, well, what goes around comes around. Yes, but we got to go a little bit deeper. What are we getting at? It develops a hierarchy of what is possible in your life. Because if you say, I'm going to treat somebody that looks well off, a certain way and treat them better than someone that doesn't look well off, you're immediately setting parameters and boundaries in your life. Because now you're saying that only way I can do well is if I look like the person that looks like they're doing well. And uh, the, if I'm doing poorly uh, and, or if I don't look like I'm doing well, that must mean that I'm not doing well. You're setting up boundaries. Knowing good and well, I watched biographies of people like Sam Walton. Sam Walton didn't wear name brand anything. And his kids are still getting paid. Lord have mercy. His kids, kids, kids are still getting paid. And many instances, he would go into a room and not be well recognized immediately. Sister Mary Davis, good to see you. Bless you. Alfred Hare, good to see you. God bless you, sir. So we got to make sure not just because of the golden rule, but we have to realize how the enemy is setting up obstacles because of the sin of partiality. When we begin to look at people superficially, we begin to look at our own life superficially. And that's creating boundaries in your mind about where you can go. Come on, somebody, stick with me right here. This hierarchy that's being mentally created by partiality is in direct odds and competition with faith. That's where we're going tonight. I want you to recognize that the sin of partiality begins to cause you to be in direct competition with faith. Oh my goodness. We read in scripture and understand without faith it's impossible to please God. Without faith it's impossible to move mountains. And that's where we begin to box ourselves in a corner with partiality because you have automatically turned off your will and desire to do better if you don't feel you look a certain way. Oh, my goodness. You've already said in your mind because of partiality that you have maybe heard, seen, or done in some other way, you're turning off the ability of God can. All right? Because you're saying because it doesn't look this way. It's not this, as opposed to if it doesn't look a certain way, God still can. Come on, somebody. We've got to look at this thing and realize what James 
and what God is trying to tell us. If we favor material riches, it says that we believe material wealth and those with it, even if it's us, we're saying uh, that those uh, with material wealth can do more than God can. We got to watch as this passage, this second chapter of James, James is recognized as really kind of going at the rich folk uh, in Jerusalem, you know, and this passage is really in your face. But what's really interesting to me is when the enemy begins to work, he doesn't let just one group get attacked. He's using it in a roundabout way to affect everybody. Come on here, somebody. Well, if he's talking about the rich folk, then uh, I'm automatically focused on what it is they have. And as I start focusing on what they have, it causes me to recognize what I don't have. And I start talking about what I don't have as opposed to what God can do. Come on, somebody. We got to recognize this afternoon, y'all, this evening, that we have to not just be hearers of the word. Come on here. Uh, we talked about it last chapter, not to just be hearers, uh, but to be doers. But I want us to go even a step further, further on this evening, uh, because there is a step in between the hearing and the doing. And we've got to watch out because partiality uh, will begin to cause issues at this step if we let it. But thanks be unto God for the second chapter of James giving us what it is we need to do. Verse 12. I want you to jump back to James, the second chapter. Verse 12. It says in verse 12 of James, the second chapter, it says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. The King James Version says to speak and to do, all right? So what am I getting at? We've got to not only just be hearers of the word and say, well, I'm not going to just sit here listening. I got to get up and do something. Well, what is it that I need to do first? You've got to first begin speaking that thing, all right? And as you speak, you've got to speak in the manner of understanding that all is at stake. Yes, indeed. And they say, well, this is just a small decision. This is just not something big. This is not something that important. Yes, it is. The butterfly effect is in effect with whatever comes out of your mouth. As you hear the word, you've got to begin to speak the word in reference to your life. You've got to not just sit in here, but you've got to get up and speak. As you declare things, you're causing it to begin to set the foundation work of doing it and making it happen. Now, as you speak it, you've got to speak it and speak more than just superficial references. you got to go, and you know in many instances, in order to speak educated and well about a certain area, you got to do some research and educate yourself on that thing. So the actual verb of speaking is has dual connotation. It not only means what's coming out of your mouth, but also what you've been putting in your mind to be able for it to come out. Scripture says what goes in not, doesn't just defile you, but what comes out. Uh, what, what's the new way of saying it? Garbage in garbage out. Good things in, good things coming out. All right. So as you begin to speak, that means you have become and are getting yourself prepared on a daily basis so that when you open your mouth, you're speaking directly to what needs to come to pass. Your foundation, it will be rocky and will be unfirm if you are not putting in inside what needs to come outside, all right? You got to make sure that that foundation is not un unstable like sand, y'all. You got to make sure it's not unstable and can be blown over, but as you govern yourselves accordingly, as you study to show yourselves approved, a workman not ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, scripture says, now as you open your mouth, you are declaring the goodness of God. You are declaring the very things. So even as you see people of different stature in life, you're speaking to them for where they're going, not for where they are. 
I want to encourage somebody's spirit on this evening that as you open your mouth, you need to be declaring the good things of God. And as you declare the good things of God, you'll begin to not only speak, but to do. Amen. Somebody that's all talk is all talk because they don't have what's necessary to really go and make it happen. But as you become prepared, you can speak. And the thing that I find is so interesting that when a prepared mind speaks, it immediately starts making things happen. Yes, it does. Because it causes you to be in the company of those that can make things happen. Minister Charles Roseboro, God bless you, sir. Good to see you. So I'm talking to somebody on this evening. Amen. I believe God wants to share with us all, just as in the 12th chapter, the 12th verse of the second chapter of James, we got to speak and then do. Amen. We not only are hearers anymore, not saying that you shouldn't be listening. We're not talking self-righteousness that causes just as many problems as partiality does, but we're talking about a threefold chord here. That as you hear the word, you begin to speak the word. And as you speak the word, y'all, it becomes and begins to come to pass to the point where you can't help but do it. Amen. Somebody can say amen right there. I'm going to hear, speak, and do. Yes, I am. Yes, indeed. Part of moving from hearing only is to first speak. And you've got to make sure that you follow that up with doing it. Amen. You talk too long about something, you'll cause the dust to settle on it. You talk too long, you might miss an opportunity. But I want you to understand that becoming prepared, being able to rightly divide what's going on is going to cause you to get to the point of being uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Get get antsy. You're going to get even just over concerned about sitting still for too long. I'm not talking about being a busybody. I'm not talking about uh, just doing stuff just to do it. But what I'm talking about is as you speak a thing, you've heard it. Now you're speaking it. You begin to recognize opportunities. And as those opportunities come, you can't help but want to move on it. Amen. We've been praying about being strategic in this day and age. Not praying to return to normal, but praying to return to what's next. Amen. That sounds like an oxymoron. I'm going back to, to go forward. Yes, whatever you need to do. But the bottom line is, is you don't need to go back to what's normal. You are in a position right now where things are lining up if you're speaking and doing. Things are coming in line that have been taking a long time. I've been watching how even things that had a whole lot more steps to be taken are getting done in a fraction of a second now because people don't want to be bothered <laughs> with you being around too long. So they're getting things that you need done. They're doing it in a fraction of the time. I need you to recognize the signs of the times. I don't need, uh, God doesn't need us, y'all, to get in a posture of recognizing all manner of uh, conspiracy and foolishness. God is trying to get those that are in the earth to be a witness of his goodness in the earth. And they can't be a witness of his goodness in the earth if they're not speaking and doing. It's time to go to work. It's time to put your hands to work. And it's time to start, as a child of God, it's time to start declaring what it is that God has for you. I'm not talking about some fool's gold wish list. I'm talking about what you heard, the promises of God that are yes and amen, the promises of God that are promised to come upon you and overtake you as Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter promises. You need some promises? You always say we always talk about standing on the promises. What are the promises? Go to Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. That's enough to keep you busy for a good long time. Yes, it is. You've got to start standing on those promises. And as you stand on those promises, it's time to declare and do. We can no longer sit aside as those that have no hope. Those that are on TV every day. Those that are being moved by what's taking place in the earth. They're operating as those with no hope. But you as a child of God have got to declare and you got to start doing it almost if it has to be a somewhat of a comical conversation with yourself to start. I want you to declare some things this week because as you declare it, God's going to manifest. 
It's going to build your faith confidence. And you're going to go from just sharing it with yourself to sharing it with others. Faith the size of a mustard seed has the ability to move mountains. So if your issue is smaller than a mountain, I encourage you to put God-sized faith to work on your behalf. The reason why you have it to this point, because that sin of partiality has caused you to think because you don't have certain things that it can't happen. Because you don't look a certain way that it can't come to pass. I say the devil is a liar. And I say, God be exalted. As you declare the promises of God, expect them to come to pass. And even get to the point of being anxious when things don't happen. As your faith grows, you're going to start even putting time limits on it. And say, God, I, I really need to hear a, a response uh, within this time frame. I really need some things to, in this area to move forward today, God. When it doesn't happen, it's going to cause you to get anxious to the point of seeking God in a greater way. See, look at that prayer like growing. You said you didn't know how to pray. You said that you didn't know all the fancy terms and words. See, that was somebody being partial that made you think because you didn't have $20 words that you couldn't talk to God. Now, as your faith begins to grow, you're in constant conversation. It's amazing that when people are in constant conversation, they are in the know with one another. They can help one another and get things done a lot faster than an email or a text message. Why don't you get in constant contact with God? He's ready to listen. He's ready to answer, but he's ready to give some instruction also. Here is how a conversation takes place. It's twofold, not a wish list, because a wish list might have you wishing for something that's the wrong way and the wrong step. Ask God to give you understanding. There's the hearing right there. If a man or woman lacks wisdom, we read that in James. Scripture says to ask because God says God freely will freely give. As you ask for wisdom, listen because wisdom will come about in the oddest ways. It'll be evident and you'll be a fool not to listen. You'll stand there and have a conversation for a split second with yourself to say, my goodness, you know what? I think I just learned something right there. God, I think I hear you speaking right there. Yes, that's exactly how it's going to happen. And I want you to not just hear it and say, oh, well, that's for somebody with more money, partiality. Oh, that's for somebody that's smart and, you know, that's got a, you know, 17 letters after their name, partiality. It's causing you to create all manner of barricades and obstacles Instead of allowing faith to reign supreme. God bless y'all. You have a blessed week. Make sure you're declaring this week that God can, God will, and God is going to do it on our behalf. Come on, somebody say amen. God bless you.